Welcome everyone to this Daniel 11 verse by verse exposition. Today we're going to be covering verse 3, part 1. You are not going to want to miss this, so be sure to grab yourself a pen and a notebook or some paper and grab your Bibles as well. This is going to be a very interesting and fascinating historical teaching on Daniel 11, verse 3. There are several facets to this particular verse, and we will be going over each facet in language that will be very easy to understand. Please do not listen to or watch this presentation if you have not listened to or watch verses 1 and 2 first. Now we're going to pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day that you've blessed us with. As we come before you, first of all, Lord, we just want to ask that you forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Please send your Holy Spirit to be with us. Give us understanding as we read these verses one by one. Please send your holy angels to be with us, protect and guide us. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. The first two verses of the 11th chapter of Daniel outline the history of the second kingdom, Medo-Persia. That portion of the chapter included in verses 3 to 13 records the history of the third kingdom, Greece. We will be continuing on from our last presentation that was done on Daniel chapter 11, verse 2. We last left off with covering the four kings mentioned in this verse. These four kings are, number one, Cambyses, the son of King Cyrus, the Persian. Number two, the false Smyrtes. Cambyses had a son named Smyrtes, and this false Smyrtes was an apostor who falsely took his place, took the place of Cambyses' son. Number three, Darius, king of Persia, also known as Darius Hystaspes. And he's also the Darius who gave the second decree found in Ezra 6.14. Number four, Xerxes also known as Xerxes the Great, who was also called a Hazarus in the Bible, which was Queen Esther's husband. And he is the son of Darius. We will be starting our presentation from this king. This king Xerxes, who came to the throne on the death of Darius, in the year 486 BC, our interest lies in the record of his dealings with the Jews, and to that history one entire book of the Bible is devoted. Xerxes is the Ahasuerus of Esther, and the book of Esther is the record of the acts of this king with reference to the people of God who were still living in the kingdom of Babylon, over which Xerxes was sole monarch. And SNH is Stephen N. Haskell, SDP is Story of Daniel the Prophet. The Medo-Persian kingdom was at its height during the reign of this king, referring to King Xerxes. Daniel was no longer living, and there were few, if any, to represent the worship of the true God in the court of the godless king. So Xerxes is considered the godless king. Xerxes was the last Persian king who invaded Grecia, and the prophecy passes over the nine successors of Xerxes, Artaxerxes of Ezra 6.14 and 7.7 as being the first of these nine successors, or the fifth king after Cyrus, who is not mentioned in Daniel 11 verse 2. So the nine successors of Xerxes in the Persian Empire and next introduces Alexander the Great. 
Although Xerxes is the last king mentioned in the vision which Daniel saw, yet God was still holding out mercy to the Israelites, and it was during the reign of Artaxerxes Longimanus, the successor of Xerxes, also known as Xerxes' son, that the final decree for the return of the Jews was issued, and that was in 457 B.C., which was the seventh year of Artaxerxes, and you can read that in Ezra 7, verses 1 through 7. So the first quote is Daniel and the Revelation, the 1897, and that's the correct edition that you want. And the second quote, once again, is from the story of Daniel the prophet. In the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes issued the commandment recorded in Ezra 7. This is the decree of the year 457 BC and is the date from which to reckon the beginning of the 2,300 days of Daniel 8.14 and also the 70 weeks of Daniel 9.24. The decree of Artaxerxes included all that was contained in the decrees of Cyrus and Darius and gave further commandment to build the wall and establish a government. And I just wanted to say right here that when you see a verse, you can pause this video and look the verses up in your Bible. So you may have to go back a few slides and do that if you haven't done so already. Continuing on in the yellow, 80 years had passed since the decree of Cyrus. 80 years of forbearance. It was not until the 20th year of Artaxerxes, after Ezra had labored for Israel 13 years, that Nehemiah came from Babylon and stirred the people into activity. Then and not till then were the walls rebuilt. Seven weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. No man can dispute but that this was accomplished under the administration of Ezra and Nehemiah. And it is very evident that these two were governors over Jerusalem 49 years, which makes the seven weeks of years and carries us down the stream of time to the year 408 BC. One week has seven days. This is referring to seven weeks. Seven weeks times seven days equals 49 days. A day in Bible prophecy is one year. And please pause here and look up to two verses, Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4.6. So 49 prophetic days equals 49 literal years. This one week prophecy, which is actually 49 literal years, may be found in Daniel 9, 24. Once again, please look up the, the verses as they are presented. Daniel 9, 25 gives us the starting point, which starts at 457 B.C. Subtract 49 years from 457 B.C., and it takes us to 408 B.C. This is when the building was complete. Daniel's mind turned to the rising power of the kingdom of Grecia, and Gabriel next spoke of the mighty one who should rule with great dominion. Medo-Persia sank into a state of weakness, and the angel withdrew his sheltering wings. Probation was passed for another nation. So we went from Babylon to Medo-Persia, and now we're going to the kingdom of Greece. Daniel 11.3 tells us, And a mighty king shall stand up, that shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. And of Greece, he says, A mighty king shall stand up, that shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. It is in this language that Alexander is introduced in the Divine Records. He's also known as Alexander the Great. He was not a Greek, 
but a Macedonian, the son of Philip of Macedon. And if you go to Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 8, which I have not included in here, but you want to make sure you go look. When you go to Daniel chapter 8, verse, I believe it is 5, yes, it tells us that Greece comes out of the West. And when Alexander came on the scene, he actually came out of Macedonia and was the king of Macedonia. So he was not a Greek, but a Macedonian, the son of Philip of Macedon. He stands in history as one of those strong characters whom God uses in spite of the fact that they are unacquainted with him. Greece spans the gulf between the Old and the New Testament. Its telling work as a nation was done during the time when there was no prophet in Israel, the period between Malachi and Christ. Hence, the book of Daniel is the only portion of the Bible which deals with this nation. The history of Greece can be traced to Javan of the family of Japheth, who with his son settled in the islands of the Mediterranean. And you can read about the sons of Japheth, I believe, in Genesis chapter 10. The Jewish people had been without a prophet for five, four or five hundred years. Malachi was the last. So during this time there was no prophet. Why? It has been stated that the history of Greece fills the time between the prophecy of Malachi and John the Baptist. We are now ready to appreciate the reason why Israel was so long without the sound of the prophet's voice. God gave Israel a system of education separate and distinct from the system of all other nations, a system which, if followed, would forever make it impossible for the people to go into captivity. But Israel often gave up her God-given system for the teaching of heathen nations. When the Jews returned from Babylon, they were strongly tinctured with Babylonian ideas of education and religion. This prepared them to accept with readiness the teachings of the Greeks. The rabbis of Jerusalem mingled the principles of Greek philosophy so thoroughly with the statutes of Jehovah, which they were commanded to teach the children that from the death of Malachi to the birth of John the Baptist, there was not a family in Judah to whom the education of a prophet could be entrusted. So, from the book of Malachi in the Old Testament to the book of Matthew in the New Testament, we're looking at a span of four to five hundred years. Four hundred and something, between four and five hundred years. The end. Any questions? If so, please post in the comment section below this video. Until we meet again, may the good Lord bless and keep each and every one of you. Bye-bye.